his presentation. Um, Brad is actually the product manager for the cloud platform uh, at Google right now. Prior to joining Google, Brad worked at, get this, Microsoft for 13 years on projects such as IE4 through IE6. So keep that in mind, by the way. Uh, I'm sure that uh, you may have more questions now. Yeah, exactly. Uh, or yeah. answers that you need to provide. Anyway, yeah. um, and he worked on Silverlight and, and a bunch of other really cool projects. So most notably, though, we know Brad as, as one of the founding members of Microsoft's .NET framework. Let's give a warm Kansas City welcome for Brad Abrams. Yeah, thanks a lot. I really appreciate you having me here. I, I'm really enjoying it. It's my first time in Kansas City. Really enjoying it here. Um, I had my first Kansas City ribs last night. Uh, fantastic. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, quite, quite jealous of Kansas City for getting the uh, fiber. So hopefully it'll go really well there so we can bring it to the Bay Area as well. So um, I work on Google's cloud platform. Uh, and it's sort of... You know, obviously everything Google does is about the cloud. And what we're trying to do in the cloud platform team is expose that to be able to run your code. So what I wanted to do is use this time, though, to talk about where we see the cloud going in the future and what is different about the cloud. So, so I have an observation, though, before we start, and that is that innovation often starts by looking backwards. Often when there's a new technology, a new innovation that comes out, the first set of problems we apply that new technology to are today's problems, or, or, or we solve them in, in the way that's framed for today. So, and I think that's true in the cloud space, but uh, I wanted to look at a couple of examples. So for example, we think about the horseless carriage. When the car first came out, um, the car, was shaped to look like what was already there, a horse and buggy system. So um, there was a, a fake horse head put it on the front of the car so as not to spook the oncoming horses that were there. Um, and they didn't have a steering wheel. They actually steered with the reins, with the, something like the reins, because that was, was more familiar to drivers that were there. So that's kind of where the, the horse and buggy uh, led influence on the car, and that may make sense. Uh, and, but, you know, today... We see we have, we have mastered the art, at least of the internal combustion engine. We've basically mastered the art and that form factor of the car, and we know what that should look like, right? And so um, and I think this is the common case with innovation. So, for example, if we look at books, when Gutenberg uh, started printing books on the press, he made them look like, uh, like a scribe had written them with the fancy calligraphy and whatnot and decorations around the side because that was common in the day. That, is, that was the uh, thing that he was replacing. And of course today, I don't know if Harry Potter is the pinnacle of the printed press, um, but you know, we know how to do printed books. You can, you can go to airport kiosks now and push a button and get the book printed right there in front of you. So we have started to master this art of the printed, uh, the printed book. Uh, and the same thing's true of the laptops. So when laptops first came out, laptop, they, they looked a lot like um, they looked a lot like desktop computers that they were replacing. That was sort of where they were beginning. And now today, uh, Apple and others have really mastered that art of what the laptop looks like. So whenever we, whenever we have a new innovation, it starts by just bringing forward from what's there today. And that's appropriate and okay. It's a great bridge to, to getting started. But we should think about how this applies to the cloud. How do we think about this sort of innovation as we're all in this process of moving to the cloud? I happen to think in, in our generation that we live in now in the tech industry, there's kind of two really big um, things that are going on and they're sort of mutually reinforcing. And that's the, the move to mobile and the penetration of uh, bring your own devices, everybody having multiple devices, and this migration to the cloud. So as we think about those innovations, how do, they, how do they apply to the cloud? Well, before we talk about that, I want to roll back and I want you to think about where you were in 2006. Where were you in 2006? Um, I was in Seattle and it, it, as I recall, it was raining. Um, 
But, you know, there, there was definitely some cultural things going on. Going on. We had a Bond movie. Um, we, we, anybody have this Nokia phone? Um, I definitely had a phone a lot like it. Um, that was the top of the industry just a few years ago in 2006. Um, but also in 2006, um, Eric Schmidt, our, our um, ex-CEO of... Um, Google actually coined the term cloud computing uh, at a search engine conference. He said he was talking about the innovations that we have around Gmail and Google Docs. And he was actually the first one to, to use the term cloud computing in the way we use it today. It, it had long been used um, in different contexts. Uh, but in the way we talk about it today, um, that was Eric. He says, we, we call this innovation cloud computing. Um, but, of course, it was only a couple of months later that Amazon launches EC2, and they uh, first popularized this notion uh, of, of infrastructure computing and bringing those workloads into the cloud just a, just a few months later. Um, but where are we now? Well, in 2012, a lot's changed. Um, I guess we still have a Bond movie um, coming out. The phones are, have looked a, a little bit different, um, and the news is still, still uh, interesting. So a, a lot has changed uh, since 2012, but um, since we've started to talk, since um, EC2 has come out and we've started to talk about this notion of cloud computing, uh, even though there's been a number of years, I still think we're in the horse and buggy era of the cloud. We're still using the cloud in a looking backwards kind of way. We're still forklifting existing workloads um, that you could run just as easily on premise, or at least they were designed to run on premise, and we're moving those into the cloud. And again, there's nothing wrong with that. That is a necessary part of evolution, but we should think, we should think about the native medium that we have, about the cloud that we are running our businesses on now, and does that enable have we mastered that medium yet? Uh, and, and I submit we, have, we haven't mastered it yet. And I think the thing that will really push us forward, that will really drive us to master that medium, is, is bringing on IT in a big way onto the cloud. And if you look at what analysts are saying, um, there's lots of big predictions about how, how much IT is going to start moving to the cloud. Uh, and, and actually, how, how many of you would, would self-assess you work in the IT industry, would say, I work in IT? Yeah, that's a very large percentage of you. So I thought it would be interesting just to take a, a minute um, to think about how the cloud generally affects what we do in IT. Uh, in IT, I noticed that there is an iceberg effect, that your users, the people at your company that consume the products that you build, the IT services that you provide, they only see the tip of the iceberg of what you do. They only see that expense reporting app or that, that order tracking, the web interface for that is all they see. But there's a whole iceberg beneath the water level where you're actually spending most of your time, most of your resources in IT goes to what's below the waterline, what customers don't see directly. So um, when you think about what's below that waterline, um, in a lot of cases, you're dealing with physical hosting. You're dealing with making sure the power's on on those machines and their hard drives aren't, uh, aren't dying and their network co connected. Um, you have the right hardware that's there. You're worried about the networking infrastructure uh, to keep the machines connected. Uh, you're running services that are there. Um, but then your value, the value that you bring, is actually in the apps that you create and the, and the experiences that you deliver to customers. Um, but you have to do a lot of, of what's below the line. And I think that's one of the reasons, because there's this disparity between what you do and what cu your customers see, that's, why, that's one of the reasons why there's a lot of pressure on IT spending in some companies, uh, because there's that difference. And so what cloud does, cloud offers you the ability to uh, abstract as much from the bottom of that stack up, abstract as much of that as you'd like to some cloud vendor so that you can focus on where you are uniquely valuable and adding unique value. So when I think, 
think about the, the cloud world and how it is different than an on-premise world. Uh, there are some hardware vendors that are out there telling you that you can have an on-premise cloud. Um, okay, I think it, lo it, it looks similar. That on-premise cloud actually looks similar to this Racks. Does, it, it, has anybody worked with a computing system that looks similar to this? You're shoving Racks into a machine. You're running power to them. I submit that this is characteristically different. At this fundamental level of what the machine you're running on is fundamentally different when you're running in the cloud. Um, so we recently, um, for the first time, opened up uh, the Google data centers for uh, press to come in and actually photograph them. Now, the vast majority of Google employees, engineers at Google, have not been in a Google data center. So it was a really big deal the fact that we decided to open this up um, and let people in to see what it looks like. So I pulled a couple of photos from here just to give you a sense of how is this, how is the Google data center different from what you see in your on-premise world. Um, you, we have, uh, va they're basically vast warehouses um, where we run uh, computing equipment. And you can see, you know, if you look at your, um, your racks that you have, a lot of times there's a little fan in the back that keeps them cool, you know, because they don't run when they're hot. This is how Google keeps our computer cool. Uh, it's massive pipes where we're pumping cold water through there. Now, we keep the, the data centers at about 80 degrees Fahrenheit, so it's a little, little warm in there, but that's, uh, energy, that's the energy efficiency that we get from running those data centers. We can run them at that, at that temperature, but even at that temperature, we have to have massive cooling apparatus. Um, so I want to think about, as you th start to wrap your head around the types of compute workloads that, that you can do with the cloud, I think it's interesting to think about the fact that you, YouTube, just take one of, the serv one of the many services Google offers, something like YouTube, more than 24 hours of video are uploaded every second to YouTube. So imagine the processing that it takes to do that, 24 hours of video every second. Um, and we, you know, from, from the YouTube perspective, we want to make sure users have a really engaging experience. So a lot of times they come to watch one video, and we want to offer them you know, more entertainment opportunity, more, more ways to engage on that site. And so one of the things we did is, is took the data that we have about uh, what videos you like to watch, uh, and we're, we did some processing on that and able to update our recommendation list of there. And, and just by doing, by taking advantage of the data that was there uh, at a very large scale, we were able to produce um, a big increase in the uh, uh, click-throughs on those recommended videos by, by taking advantage of that powerful data. Um, yeah, obviously we have miles and miles of cable uh, available in the Google data centers. Um, and we have... Uh, professionals that are dedicated to their jobs of keeping this, these data centers up and running. Um, and, you know, obviously, uh, you know, you, you can hire engineers as well to keep data centers up and going. But the economies of scale that you get when you have data centers at the size that Google has, um, we can really have people that um, are, spe like, uh, this guy is specializing in keeping our cooling systems up and going there. Yeah, so um, the other thing I wanted to mention is uh, think about Gmail. I imagine a large percentage of you use Gmail here. Think about the volume of uh, email and the instant access you have for this. I, I was on the cab on the way over here uh, from the airport and um, didn't know the address of the hotel, but they had emailed me a confirmation. It took me a few seconds from my phone to be able to get to search all of my email with a, a write keywords, and, and find exactly that message. And we're able to offer that service at an enormous scale for people. Uh, yeah, so uh, we have these uh, Google bikes. The data centers are actually so big that uh, in order for employees to get around them, they actually have to ride on these, ride on these fun little bikes that are there. Um, and we have people that are doing, are routing traffic uh, and making sure that in, in cases of like there is some act of God, some weather event or whatnot, we're able to move compute workloads around from one part, from one data center to another data center um, instantly uh, based on where to ensure the service stays highly available, highly reliable. 
Um, we recent, uh, I guess it's been a few months now, we launched um, Google Instant, uh, the instant search. So uh, I internally we call it psychic search. So we're able to know based on what other people are searching for, what you've searched for in the past. When you start typing a search query, complete that query for you. And if you think about the corpus of data over which we have to process that, it's actually a pretty amazing thing. And what's interesting about these examples is that the type, they, they may seem like out there examples for your IT world today, but I predict in, a, in the next year or two, you're going to have similar big data types of problems that you need to go solve. Yeah, and, and we deliver this search results. Um, imagine, the again, the amount of data that we process over, and in less than a quarter of a second, uh, you get search results back. So it's, it's pretty astounding. So um, our jobs at Google really is to make all that complexity you saw with the data centers and whatnot, make it look simple and easy for users. And I submit to you that that's, that may be your job as well in the IT world is to take the complexity and make it look simple. So, you know, when we think about this, and one way to look at the pictures I've shown you and the tour of our data centers is that Google has a lot of computers. Um, and in fact, we are a large buyer of, of computing equipment. But really, the way we've come to think about it internally and the way it really operates is we, we have a Google computer. We have one Google computer. That Google computer has data centers and it has racks and it has networking equipment and it has hard drives and, and CPUs in it, um, lots and lots of CPUs. Um, but we call this thing the Google computer. And so if you think about that, that Google computer, the operating system that runs on that Google computer, the types of distributing the workloads and managing it, the services that are available for that computer. It's quite an astounding thing to think about. Um, but what I think is even more cool is that, well, I'll get to the more cool, more cool thing in a minute. Um, we have taken um, the technologies behind, the, the, the operating system for that Google computer, uh, pieces of it, uh, and over the last few years, we have open sourced large parts of that. Um, and that has helped to spur innovation in, in what I would consider native cloud type workloads. So if you, you can go and find uh, academic papers on GFS, it's the Google file system, uh, and MapReduce. Uh, those are the technologies we first started to use to get insights about um, search patterns and whatnot to be able to serve more relevant content to users. Um, and th those technologies, as we have um, open sourced some code and published the papers on how to do this, um, uh, people have taken them up and produced things like Hadoop. And, uh, um, and then we've seen companies have built really impressive businesses on top of that. You look at companies from, from Facebook, Yahoo, are all using these, these types of technologies. Um, and then in 2006, we um, started talking about Bigtable. Uh, Bigtable is uh, the name of the technology we stored our massive index of the web in. And you can imagine that's a, that's a pretty big computing problem. Um, so we created some new technology for doing that called Bigtable. Uh, and people took the, the paper uh, that we wrote on Bigtable and produced a, a, a lot now, uh, NoSQL data stores, that actually started to challenge the notions of what was needed in a data store. Uh, and that, that has created lots of innovation that, again, you see, you see starting to penetrate many industries now. And then more recently, we've released technologies. Uh, Dremel is the way we do logs analysis at Google so we can get insight, real-time instant insights into what's really happening with our properties at a very large scale. So that's Dremel. Um, and Colossus is the next generation of our Google file system. We've released papers on those, and that has helping to spur the big data uh, movement that's been going on. So what's interesting is now we're taking a switch from just open sourcing the technologies that are there and letting you run them themselves to letting you run your code in the Google computer. There's that massive computer, I showed you all those pictures of that. 
we're giving you an opportunity to run your code and take advantage of the same network fabric that we have, the same fiber that we've run uh, between all those data centers, uh, the same peering relationships we have. Uh, we're letting you run your code to take advantage of that. Um, and this is a project called the Google Cloud Platform. Um, and it's really got two main parts. It's got App Engine and Compute Engine. Um, and then a set of services that you're able to consume from either of those two uh, services. So let me talk about App Engine uh, briefly. Um, it's been around for a number of years, um, but it's really only been in the last, say, year or so that Google's gotten serious about it as a business. Now, okay, we want to really offer this in a way that, uh, that people can reliably bet their business on. Uh, and it is a, a platform as a service offering. I, I submit to you it's the original platform as a service offering. It sort of kicked off that, that field. And it was really born uh, out of uh, Google engineers' frustration for the complexity to deploy a real distributed system. To have it be geo-scaled, um, to have it be highly reliable, to have it handle peaks and, and workloads. Um, at Google, we're, we, we just don't launch services that, we, that are not intended for millions of users to go uh, hit and access. And App Engine is designed to make that significantly easier. So you write your code in Java or Python, um, and then we have an environment that that runs in. You just upload that code, and we run it on the Google computer for you. So um, when we have an uh, engineer at Google who likes to write these cartoons, and this, this one really caught my attention. Um, and, and as an engineer, it's rare that you get a chance to work on a greenfield uh, application, but I know you really want to because you've been through a Byzantine systems and you would not make a Byzantine system happen. I know you wouldn't, but it does happen. What, what happens when you do get a chance to work on a green field is requirements change, deadline change, management's change, technology stack changes. All these changes happen to you, and before you know it, you're building that same Byzantine system you promised yourself you would not build. Um, and this is the promise that I think App Engine has for you. By being a platform as a service and being higher up the stack gives you an opportunity to let a lot of those decisions to have been made for you and just use the services that are available from the Google computer. Um, so one of the great pieces about App Engine um, is that it's, it's very efficient and simple for you. Uh, at Google... Um, we run very massive services, and so inefficiencies, you know, a, a memory leak here or there, uh, small inefficiencies in the code, when they're multiplied out at a tremendous scale, um, actually start costing real money. Um, so there's a big emphasis at Google on keeping things simple and efficient, and App Engine really epitomizes that. Because with, with App Engine, you literally pay for only what you use. Uh, and what, what I mean by that is if there are zero hits to your site, you pay nothing. As soon as the first hit comes, you can, you, um, we spin up, we very quickly spin up your instance and serve that. That, that keeps it very efficient. Um, so um, it's, it's great for really spiky workloads. Uh, we, I talked to one of our, our big customers who is experiencing month over month doubling in traffic. Uh, every uh, every month, and they're at a pretty large volume now, and they have nobody looking at it. Nobody looks at, at their servers to make sure things are working. It just works. Their developers deploy multiple times a day to their live production service with no um, no IT admin ops kind of guys because they've learned just to trust App Engine with that thing scaling. And as it, as it spikes, App Engine spins up instances, and when, it, um, when those spikes go away, it tears them down. So um, because of this, App Engine is growing uh, very quickly. Um, we, just to highlight one of these stats, um, we have, I believe, the largest NoSQL data store uh, on the planet. Um, there's over two trillion uh, operations on that thing, um, and lots and lots of data is stored there. So, um, and you can see just th this, the hits all up. It's, uh, um, it's already one of the top uh, properties at Google. And so if you're comparing it to the other services Google has, that's pretty, that's pretty impressive. 
So um, that's App Engine, and that's, our, that's the platform part of the Google computer. But there are definitely times when you need lower level access, when you need, you need to be root. I mean, we're developers, sometimes you need to be root. Um, and you want to take more control over what you have. You want to run some package software that's already out there, that's kind of part of the solution space you have. And for that, we recently announced Compute Engine. So Compute Engine is our virtual machine hosting. So what we've done is we've actually um, taken a, a virtual machine abstraction and made it so it can run in the Google computer. It can run in that exact same data center and fab, network fabric and, and whatnot that's there. And so it's, it's normal Linux. You get, uh, you get root access to that and you can install whatever you want to on there. Um, so, yeah, um, we have uh, you know, pers persisted disk technology as well as the local disk. We have a rich set of tools and APIs uh, for you to go build that. The customers we see now spend lots of time with the REST APIs in order to, to spin up um, really large sets of instances. The, the first place we're starting with this um, is, is big compute workloads. Think about very large MapReduce type activities. Uh, think about video encoding at, at large scales where you may need 100 or 1,000 cores for a few hours and then you don't need any more after that. Um, another one that we're working on is um, real-time ad bidders. So uh, I'm sure you've done a Google search before. You may have noticed on the right-hand side there are ads there. Um, we're, we're launching a way that uh, advertisers can actually decide what, what ad to show the moment the query comes in. So if they have data that says, hey, it's raining in Kansas City right now, and, they know, and the query comes in from somebody in Kansas City for um, umbrellas or directions, they, they can show the most appropriate ad possible there. So the type, if, if uh, you recall, it's like a quarter of a second that you get to respond to that query. Um, and they're able to use the large networking power uh, that Compute Engine offers to be able to service that sort of workload. So that's where we are with Compute Engine. Um, the last piece I wanted to mention was about um, this explosion of data that we see. If you look at sort of the first 500 years uh, of our history, uh, around the time Gutenberg was working on his um, press, if you look at all the books, magazines, everything published in that time, that's about 12 exabytes of data. So that's a lot of data. But today, we're seeing 12 exabytes created every two days. The volume of data, if you just look at the, the, that graph, where is that going to be a year from now, two years from now? Um, the volume of that data is increasing exponentially. And I think we have to use a different sort of cloud workload to be able to handle that sort of size and scale of data. And you know, that dealing with really large data problems, that is at its essence what Google does. That is the purpose of the Google computer, really, is to find meaning from lots of data in a really instant sort of way. That's core to our mission. That's what we're doing with search. Um, and now, with the Google Cloud Platform, it's those exact same technologies and tools we're exposing for you to use for your own technologies. So uh, one, one early such product that we're starting to come out with is this product called BigQuery. Um, and it is the productization of Dremel, um, the thing we do logs processing on. Um, and I remember when I first joined Google a couple of years ago, uh, I heard this, uh, one of our vice presidents was telling me this story about how we decided a few years earlier to pivot our business uh, from feature phones to smartphones. Um, we, to, to pivot our, the properties that we're working on, how we're optimizing search. And at the time, feature phones were dominant. And if you just looked at the market, you'd say, wow, there's a lot of feature phones. But because we had, we, we, we had um, an engineer who went and looked at the Google search logs, and now there's a, that's a lot of data, but he was able to do real-time ad hoc analysis of the Google search logs, form hypothesis 
prove them or disprove them. Look at trends over time very quickly and in an ad hoc way. And from that, got some insight into what was happening in the market. Um, and so we have productized tools that let you do that over your own data sets, your own private data sets that only you have access to. Um, you can do um, ad hoc analysis to get insight to say, well, wh what's really happening with my product? Um, at Google, we, we talk about being data blind. Um, I'll confess, I'm data blind on one of the products I have right now. I don't, I don't know what's going on. Um, and that's considered to be a really bad thing. And th these tools help you not be data blind anymore. Uh, and so you can do ad hoc analysis. And then with partnering with some of the third parties that we have, once you've gotten that insight and you know the factors that are actually driving and governing your business, you can whip up dashboards very quickly that shows the progress of that over time. And you can drive your business looking at this dashboard on an ongoing basis. So that's BigQuery. Um, so generally, just to sum up here, um, my pitch to you is not only do we need to look at the, the cloud, but we need to start, start looking at how we move on from this era of the horse and buggy cloud to the native cloud kind of workloads. Now, if you're, if you're uh, evaluating cloud and you're just pulling your on, you're just running WordPress in the cloud or bringing your on-premise stuff to your cloud, that's appropriate. That's, that's, that's fine. Um, that's a good use of the cloud right now. But we need to start looking forward to, to what comes after that. So, um, yes, these looking back workloads uh, primarily dominate today. If you look at what's running on EC2 or Rackspace today, it's primarily these looking backwards workloads. But the cloud offers a fundamentally different kind of computing. Um, software, it, it's, it's, it's like a different computer. It's a different architecture to run native cloud workloads. Um, and then selfishly, I happen to think Google is a pretty good place um, to go invest in those new and different kinds of workloads. So, thank you. We probably have time for one or two questions. We have one or two? One or two questions. Okay, yeah, sorry. Well, one or two questions here, so you can get back on schedule. Anyone? Yeah. Yes, yes. Yes, so the question is, how does Google balance uh, providing stability uh, with being cutting edge? Um, and, I mean, that's a good question that we do struggle with. You know, uh, math, so with App Engine, uh, he mentions Master Slave, which was our original uh, wrapping of Big, Big Table, and now we've moved on to HRD, which is a new a new wrapping. Um, and really, we it's it's learning. We apply like we applied the learnings from uh, from customers and outages with that with, with uh, Master Slave into um, the the new HRD. Um, and so, really, how we think about how we think about this is that we're very new. I mean, generally, the cloud space is new, um, and so we want to be very careful about providing a stable platform. But we don't want to get locked into not being able to innovate. Um, and so, it is definitely a balance that we're conscious of and thinking about. Um, but we, we, we're sort of erring, as you probably feel it, we're sort of erring on the side of moving, moving forward uh, at, a, at a good pace. So one more question, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, uh, that's a great question. How, how do I see development environments changing as we get, uh, go into the cloud? Um, you know, I think that, uh, you know, almost every major part of the IT industry has been, has been shifted by uh, software as a service, except for developers. You developers are Luddites, mostly. I mean, everybody, the sales guys are using stuff like Salesforce, and the business guys are using other online tools. Uh, but as developers, how many still use Emacs, Viat, Vim, or something on a workstation? Yeah, that's, uh, or, or Eclipse, or some, some installed software, Visual Studio. Um, I think it, it's, I think there's, it's ripe for innovation there. And, and you're seeing people, um, XOIDE, Cloud9, uh, there's a bunch of them that, that, that are innovating in offering sort of this, this type of experience. So. 
So uh, I'll be around uh, later today. Uh, look forward to connecting with you. Thank you. Thank you for that. No, it's all good.